So my name is Paula Kamen. I'm an author and freelancer, and I'm in Andersonville. It's it's a northern, um, it's to the north side of Chicago by Foster and Clark area. So, I guess I'm just gonna gonna say a little bit about my work that um, that maybe maybe I represent uh, the the idealistic, poor, self-employed feminist uh, demographic of the year 2000. So I'm not sure how big that is. Um, I've been living here for about 10 years in all, all different neighborhoods, uh, but in the last few years the rents have all gone up, so, so now I'm staying put in this neighborhood for a while. Um, and I, I started about 10 years ago, I wrote a book uh, on young women's views of feminism. So it, it, was, sor it was sort of uh, described as as the first book to, to describe, um, describe Generation X views of feminism or people like me who were born in the 60s and 70s, so I'm 33 right now, um, cause, because I, I wanted to, to sort of um, to create a, to create um, a way to, to sort of to sort of um, to communicate between the generations that in, in, that Chicago was, was a huge feminist hotbed in the late 60s, early 70s, and a lot of the women's movement, a lot of the main activism of the women's movement started started it at that time you know some of the real work that was done in the women's movement was done here and and it's so easily forgotten or even even work that was done like 30 years ago already already young women have no idea it took place so a lot of my work is sort of is sort of communicating between generations of women um, and and this is all this is all so we don't take past things for granted you know, I, I continue to make progress and I'm always pretty ambitious. Um, for this, this is the first book that came out, like I said, about ten years ago. And um, let's see. And I interviewed a few hundred people for that, and it went through four printings, and it uses a textbook. And then I spent um, the last seven years working on, on a second book. Um, this is for NYU Press on young women's sexual attitudes. Um, because in doing this on, on feminism, I went to schools, and a lot of the big activism you know, in, in the 90s, um, it, was, it was around being able to do things on your own terms. And so this generation has a huge sense of entitlement growing up with the women's movement and the sexual revolution, education, and jobs. Um, so on college campuses, I saw act. I saw a lot of activism for pro-choice, for gay and lesbian, bisexual rights, against acquaintance rape, sexual harassment. So all, the, all these issues with young women seem to be seem to be really coming to light because this is a much more open society to address some of, some of these issues that were just too too taboo to discuss even 30 years ago. And there was a whole new sense of entitlement that we have too, you know, to to discuss these things. Mm -hmm. And so, and so this is um, this is where I this is where I work. Uh, I, I even I even cleaned it up a little bit before before you came, which you probably couldn't tell. Um, and, and behind you, there's there's a whole bunch of boxes of drafts. So I'm I'm just finishing this week uh, the galleys that I got from the publisher. So this is a typeset book before before it gets published. And, and yeah, behind you here are different drafts um, of the book, and there's also around the corner here too. Um, so probably about about five boxes of drafts. So here I can show you. So, so right. So this is all drafts. The, the, those three boxes um, too. And I was out of town, so all the New York Times <laughs> piled up. Here. So I just have to keep track of current events. Then all these all these file cabinets. Uh, there's there's different articles related to this topic, um, you know, to, to to issues to issues around young women in the United States. This is to be filed. Um, see, these are bills that are that are piling up while I'm working on all this stuff. Um, <laughs> and these magazines I used, and some books I used. Yeah, and these are these are some of the most important articles used in the book, so the most accessible here. So lots of this government studies, academic studies, stuff from the popular media. And so these are the most important articles that I used <laughs> right over here on this shelf. So so it's so there's different levels of access I have to it. Um, and let's see. Let me see what else. Um, so tell me a little bit about this, your ideas about the state of the women's movement in the year 2000. 
Okay, it's a very good question. So yes, I spent a lot of the last ten years thinking about that. So, that, so with young women, uh, there seems to be sort of sort of a contradiction where, where on one hand they believe in in the most basic feminist principles. You know, that, that I went on the street and asked someone in the asked, if I asked a woman in the year two thousand, you know, in her twenties or thirties, if she believed in equal pay for equal work, she would say, of course. Um, if I asked her if she believed that she had the right to 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 wear whatever she wanted and not be um, and, and, and not be attacked, you know, she would say, "Are you kidding? Of course, you know." And and, and being, being equal to men in relationships, having access to education and jobs, you know, it's just it's just something that we take for granted that even 30 years ago would have been radical. But then, if you ask them if they identify as a feminist, then it's, it's very likely that they'll say no about it because there's sort of a reluctance to take an active stand or, or, or a political stand for these issues. So um, it's, it's more passive. And so, so what concerns me is that a lot of these rights could just be wiped away, you know, if there aren't people standing up more actively about it. And there's been sort of a feminist stigma, and that's sort of what I analyze in the first book. You know, there's a lot of negative connotations with it. And I see that as sort of, sort of like a mechanism keeping people or like keeping, or, or keeping young women in line, you know, these um, a lot of negative stereotypes of feminists, like they're all man haters, or you know, totally angry, or um, you know, um, all these all these different negative stereotypes. So they sort of keep women from being more active in the movement, you know, and participating in it. So, so what do you propose? <laughs> That's a good question. So just my contribution is just to get people talking about it. You know, in these books, um, it helps it helps just raise these questions. So, so I always say, um, you know, in the feminists, um, you know, that a big goal um, is not is it, it isn't it isn't a t it isn't to tell young women what to think. It's to try to encourage them to think critically, so they don't have to totally agree with with all my stances on issues. So, but just, to, but just to not take all these things for granted and just um, ask some basic questions about it. What so, does thinking critically mean? So, <laughs> so that's a good question. Um, uh, to not take things for granted, you know, to 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 understand um, about where things were about thirty years ago, um, or or even in some in some cases like ten or fifteen years ago. Uh, to not just or to sort of see. Um, how a lot of the choices that they make in life are framed by political and cultural forces, so that uh, each woman in every generation, of her entire life, um, is shaped by a whole different set of choices that she has. You know, that, that or that are available in that era. And so, my grandparents, um, um, or my grandmother about a hundred years ago was it was it was obviously a whole different a whole different life a whole different set of choices and my mom in the sixties a different life and me in the year two thousand you know and and just amazing you know, in every generation uh, your whole life uh, it depends on or or um, a lot of the basic things in your life depend on the era in which you were born you know and for men that's true to some extent but not the extreme. Because like it seems like in every generation, also the cultural definition of, of what a woman is changes. You know that in one generation, the ideal is that she's very passive, you know, and deferential, and another one it could be that she's stronger, more questioning. You know, so so just not to accept reality as um, at, at face value, I guess, to think critically. Mm. So. Do you have a piece from something you're working on that you'd like to read, either from a book that you already wrote or that you've already written, or a piece you're working on now? <laughs> I mean, you say that they're uh, textbooks. Uh, I'm not sure whether that's appropriate or not. But there's something. Is there something that you've written that speaks to the essence of what you're about or what you're trying to accomplish in your work, or about the findings from your past research or what's what you're working on now? That's a good question. Let me let me see. See, I have this that I just took out because I was referring to it. Um, I'm not sure. Um, 
Yeah, yeah, this is, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure how exciting, it's, well, this is from the news, this is from the Chicago Tribune, just a commentary that sort of relates um, to the book that I'm writing. So it sort of, um, it sort of talks about the, the whole Monica Lewinsky thing that happened. So, so this was a woman in her 20s, and she was sort of condemned in the media as this tramp and this, you know, aberrant type person, and I'm sort of arguing in this article that she represents a sort of a whole new generation's of views of entitlement and and acting more like men, you know, and, and initiating things and um, having more power. So that's sort of what this is about. How do men act? <laughs> so out of this book, it shows how young women act um, act more like men and have traditionally, you know, and that's because because they, because they have more power to do so. Um, that men traditionally. Um, uh, they just um, are more aggressive sexually, you know, in, in initiating relationships uh, and having more partners and starting earlier. You know, and, and just in the last 30 years, it's, it's my book documents and what this article talks about, it's sort of changed. So where their behavior patterns in a lot of ways are almost identical. So like 30 years ago, guys like started have, having sex much, much earlier, and, and, and now it's like the same age. You know, and they might have recorded just many more partners in life, and, and now it's almost the same. So, so you just see the difference um, in the, uh, just what happens is when women have more power and education and everything, so they become, uh, so they act more like men. And, and so there's, there's still some differences, but, but it's just uh, more similar than it's ever been, probably. Can you tell me you made reference to Chicago being a hotspot of women's movement through in the women's movement throughout history? Can you tell me a little bit about what's taking place in Chicago or who the players are that makes this a specifically unique uh, location within the history of the women's movement? Okay, that's a good question. Um, let's see. In the late '60s, um, uh, there was a University of Chicago student named Heather Booth, you know, and she started one of the one of the first student feminist groups at the University of Chicago. And she helped to start the first um, autonomous feminist group, period. And that was called the West Side Group. And that was in the late 60s. And that, that was just, there was like a discussion group with different women. And then she and a whole bunch of people started in the late 60s, the Chicago Women's Liberation Union. And that was sort of um, sort of an umbrella group for a whole bunch of other groups in the city. You know, an example is they had a graphics collective, and they made posters, and those went out all over the country, and were sort of like the images, you know, of the grassroots women's movement, you know, throughout the country. They had a rock band, you know, and they and they, and they sold the vinyl, to, you know, all over the country. Um, and then that was, that was a model for this kind of group, and that sort of spread all all over the country. And, and so Chicago was sort of was sort of um, it was it was where a lot of things started, and where a lot of the where a lot of the real work was done of the women's movement. That it wasn't just people talking. You know, a lot of really concrete things were done. Um, and and one way that I chronicled that is I wrote a play called Jane, and that's based on oral histories of, of people who operated and used an underground abortion service in Chicago. Um, it was called Jane. That was a code word, and the woman would a woman would call up um, and they would ask for Jane, you know, and so that was that was that was like a shorthand, uh, and and that was the best kept secret in Chicago. So where where in a very short period that was that was from from sixty eight to seventy three. Uh, they performed o over 10,000 safe abortions on women in Chicago, and, and the police knew about it, the clergy, hospital staff, social workers, college administrators. Um, so, and, and this is an example um, of the feminists in Chicago really taking action you know, in, in what they believed in, you know, and not just... Uh, and not just theorizing, even though even though a lot of important theory also also came out of uh, Chicago at that time. Famous feminists uh, were from here, and some of them um, are um, are Shulamith Firestone. There was Joe Friedman, um, or Joe Freeman probably, <laughs> and 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 a whole bunch of other ones that just worked you know, at at the grassroots level. Mm -hmm. So you told me a little bit about your 
previous books and your previous work and about the research you're doing now. What sorts of ideas do you have about the future of the movement or as you see it based on the work that you're doing now? Okay, but for the future of the movement? Yeah, yeah. The, the women's movement. I mean, based on the attitudes that you hear from young women in the city of Chicago about sexuality and about gender and things like that, I mean, yeah. where do you see the I, those ideas and that information going in the future? People's attitudes or, you know, whether it's public policy or it's workplace or relationships or... Yeah, it's a good question. So the title of my second book is called Her Way. Um, and that's um, and that's basically a theme for the future is young women doing things, doing things on their own terms. You know, no matter what that is, it could be acting more like men. It could be taking some more traditional female attitudes. It's basically women living life without a script as much. You know, to, and it's more according to, to individual um, to sort, sort of individual paths. So I see that happening more and more. Um, but I'm not sure politically if so much is is going to happen. So that, like I said, we take a lot of things for granted, and so and so a lot of the parts of the women's movement that have to do with individual rights, they've sort of been been embraced, and this is why this is why um, a lot of these sexual issues have, have been so popular among young women. It was a lot of it is about it's about individual rights, but then when it comes to organizing more on a political level, I don't see it as much. Um, and um, and right now in in. Um, in the activist circles and young feminist activist circles are sort of experimenting with the politically incorrect. And so... What does that mean? So like um, in the 70s, there was a big crusade against, say, pornography or or like uh, strippers or prostitutes, which we call sex workers. You know? and, now, and now some young feminists are saying, well, it's all a matter of choice. Um, so you might have, have some young feminists writing some stuff that's sexually explicit, you know, and saying that it's all a part of our expression and, 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 and not necessarily some, some bad objectification of women or exploitation of women. So that's, so that's sort of an era that we're in now of sort of um, playing around with a lot of these things um, and, not, and not being, and not showing reality as black and white. So, so a positive of that is you get a movement that's more flexible and perhaps a negative is that people aren't um, as united about different things, or, um, or they might not be as political. So, so with the women's movement, though, it's always a mystery about, about where it's going to go. So, it, so I almost feel like there has to be some horrible crisis or tragedy um, in terms of women's rights being taken away, you know, in order for people to act. And so, like, if we see abortion rights being being taken away, you know, the next in the next few decades, we might see suddenly an upsurgence, you know, of of the women's movement. Mm -hmm. Is that right now? We're in the presidential race of two thousand. Right. Presidential. Uh, it seems like the next president will have the opportunity to appro uh, to appoint new Supreme Court justices, and the possibility of overturning Roe vs. Wade has come up with the appointment of perhaps more conservative justices. What do, you, what do you know about that, or what's the reality of the threat of that? So yeah, that's definitely um, that's definitely a threat. There's a reason why why I wrote this play, Jane. And and by the way, if it's if it's like a hundred years from now or something, it might still be um, the Northwestern University Library in the Special Collections Department. I gave them all my transcripts of people I interviewed who used the service, who ran it. Mm. So so also to uh, to uh, immortalize me too when I'm long gone here. <laughs> Um, so, but yeah, you know, it's definitely a threat to Supreme Court, you know, it's, it's very close now, if they just get like one or two more conservative justices, you know, who are anti-choice, and that's all going to be gone, so a lot of it depends on the presidential election coming up, you know, and, and, um, and as I write about in my book, a majority of young women don't know that, they think that it's written in stone, you know, it's a guaranteed right, you know, um, and they don't realize just what kind of, uh, or just how tenuous it is. You know, in every era, women women have gained a different rights, and there's always a backlash against them afterwards. So, like in the 1800s, with the with like with like Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth and, and, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton fighting, you know. There was a backlash against them, and in the, in the 60s, you know, a backlash after that, you know, um, in the 80s, so it's always a struggle. What, so. what are you passionate about in life? What's important to you? 
boy, is a good question. Um, let's see. <laughs> uh, let's see, just a little small talk here. What's what's important to me? Um, um, what are you passionate about? I mean, what drives your work? Uh, what is it about this line of work that makes it so important and so powerful for you? Um, yeah. How does it feel to know that your work is being used as a textbook in classrooms and that you're shaping some of the dialogue yourself, perhaps? Right. Um, to be a colonist for the Tribune and to have that many people read your opinions yeah. and your ideas and perhaps be a, from the very opposite end of the spectrum in terms right. of the way they perceive it, etc.? Hmm. That's a good question. It it just um, it just happens so naturally that that's, that I sometimes don't, don't even think about it. So by the way, yeah, I, I, or, or, or this was just, just an opinions piece that I wrote for the Tribune. So once in a while, yeah, I freelance for them, but it's not it isn't a regular column. Mm -hmm. But but um, I guess for some reason it's important for me to make my mark. You know that. So this is why I'm I'm happy to talk to you. So that when I'm gone, you know, just just to have made an influence um, on the world around me, you know, and I sort of see my role as just as just sort of a consciousness raiser. And like I said, I'm not trying to brainwash people or make everyone think exactly what I think. So so I sort of see myself as someone as someone uh, who just sort of uh, is is provocative, uh, who gets people thinking, you know, and asking questions they wouldn't have asked. And, and specifically yeah, on, on issues of, of gender and, and sexuality, because because uh, just by definition it it shapes women's lives. I guess I guess I've always just just had an innate um, an innate interest in, in in women and women's rights and um, and trying to advance that cause. So and and also a big thing is the big picture. That I sort of see myself. Um, 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 I used to work at a newspaper, and, and that, that, was, that was that was great from day to day. So, but I want to. Um, so, but sometimes it gets lost about these huge changes happening around us because sometimes they're so slow we take them for granted. So I sort of want to alert people, you know, to, to the really big picture, which is sort of what you're doing here. So. So. When the reader was here, what was their story about on you? What was their story about you on? Oh, okay. I, I had done a play, a comedy called Seven Dates with Seven Writers. It's at the Improv Olympic, which is a comedy place here, mm -hmm. just for comic relief after writing on all these serious issues. So, so I want to do more of that. And so Chicago is a big comedy center and a big theater center. So it was fun to take part in that. Mm -hmm. What's the state of the sort of Chicago literary scene these days? of the state of the child literary scene. Um, it's, it's interesting that with us, we don't have the glamour and the glitz often of New York. So I know writers in New York, and they're going to, to much more fabulous parties than I go to. But then, on the other hand, it's, 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 e it's easier to get work done here, you know, where we're pretty hard working, that the rents aren't as bad as New York, and I'm not distracted by all these fabulous, uh, glamorous goings on. So. So there's just a, just a lot of real work, you know, being done here, um, and um, and and there is a subculture of freelance writers and doing more progressive work. But it is it is difficult to survive, though. And ironically, the economy's gotten bad over the last few years, and so a lot of people have gone to go work at corporations or. Or suddenly, suddenly these people are um, are marketable because because they need them for the dot coms or 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 like their communication skills or their street cred or their their cultural knowledge is suddenly um, so, so, suddenly valued uh, valued by people who have full time jobs to give them. You know, so so I'm not sure about that impact. Or it's almost easier in some ways during the recession <laughs> because there were more people around. Um, and didn't have the alternative, you know, to, to go work at the corporation or whatever. But it is a struggle. A lot of people I know who've written for, uh, or who've been uh, freelancers or had, or had like more grassroots type stuff, they can't afford to do it anymore. You know, it, it's just um, after you after you get a certain age and there's more bills piling up and your standard of living um, sort of increases, it's it's difficult. 
so it is a struggle that in Chicago, it's, it's sort of, it's sort of, or, or Chicago as as everywhere in this country, it's very difficult to do to do this work from the margins. You know, it's sort of critical of the greater society. Do you see yourself being able to sustain a career over decades uh, as a freelancer, as a person who, uh, yeah, will be able to sustain that? Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try. I always joke that that I have no choice to do this because I'm totally incompetent in every in anything else, you know. So, so just by default, you know, and 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 you only live once. So, so this is what's meaningful to me. I and, and I see my biggest talent as an independent voice. So that as someone's employee, I might just be like sub mediocre. But then, as my as my own person, or as as an independent voice or an author, I'm probably you know um, you know in in, uh, in a higher echelon. So so, but yeah, definitely is a struggle. It's gonna be tough. So to people who years from now look back on this footage and they see this interview with Paul Kamen and they wonder, what are your suggestions as to other colleagues of yours, people out there whose work you admire, who other people might not know about and should look into to learn about? Mm, okay. That's a good question. Um, in Chicago or in the country? In Chicago, in the country, in the world. Okay, that's, a, that's good. There was a book that came out a, a year or two ago called Slut. <laughs> that's by, it's by an author, Leora Tannenbaum. Um, and that's that's from Seven Stories Press in New York, and and then also documents young women's sexual attitudes. There's a book called Jane, and and that's and that's the book form about this underground abortion service that was in Chicago, and that was published in '95 by University of Chicago Press. Um, let's see, there's some zines out that I I was profiled in one in one called Bitch, <laughs> and that's the title of it. There's sort of this movement among young feminists to reclaim a lot of politically incorrect words, you know, Such you as? know, like things that were insults before to women, they're sort of reclaiming that with pride, like bitch, you know, and there's, there's also a magazine or, is, or, or, a, 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 or like, um, a homegrown zine out of, out of New York called Bust, um, you know, and there's different, different feminist bands, you know, and, and, and they have names like that. There's one from the early to mid-90s called Hole, and I, I have a little sticker on my file cabinet. <laughs> you know, so that's, that's traditionally a pretty, a pretty negative way to refer to women, but they've sort of taken it sort of tongue-in-cheek. So that's, so that's sort of like a little sub-movement of young feminists. Mm. Um, any other terms or phrases come to mind within that context? Well, let me think. Um, uh, there's some on the trip. I can repeat them here, but uh, <laughs> so I don't want to to cut your funding here, but uh, to get the religious right after us. But there's. Um, let me see. I'm try, trying to think. Uh, there's a book that just came out that's really popular among among young feminists. That, it's something like hotcakes. It's called C U N T, and it's about it's about um, about female sexuality. It's taking the, the most dreaded word you could ever use to describe a woman. You know, we're sort of sort of reclaiming that. How do you feel about the word, use of words like that? <laughs> so I don't know how we got on this topic here, but but um, it's. It's, it's a part of the movement. It, it wouldn't appeal to everybody. It, it might turn off that person working at the bank in the loop or something, you know. So, so I guess with feminism, it takes all kinds, you know. So you need the more radical people to get stuff going and generate dialogue, you know, and then the more mainstream, middle-of-the-road people, you know, to attract the masses to it. So... What about your ideas about the time and place we live in? at this point in history, either about Chicago or about our nation, about this point in history, socially, culturally, politically. Hmm. It's sort of a strange time that I really feel feel like sort of an oddball because, because, because we are going through a better economic time and people I went to college with who have similar degrees, um, they're making about five times as much money as I am. And just going in a more conventional path, you know, and that's working for a dot com or for like a business trade magazine or something. What is a dot com? Okay. 
uh, like with the internet, uh, some of these companies that are sort of sort of sort of targeted toward the internet. They're on the World Wide Web, so it's a whole new medium here, and they need and they need more creative, irreverent types that know how to communicate. So it's a, it's a whole it's it's a whole sector that's now employing uh, types that usually would have just been bohemians or on the margins of society or something. So it's sort of a tough time for people like me whose whole career is based on social issues because it doesn't really seem to be um, seem to be in the air as much you know as it was in, in, the, in the about thirty years ago. There was an organized women's movement. There was a lot of political ferment. You know, the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement. So, so I'm sort of, so in ways, I'm jealous of, of feminists from 30 years ago. So there's a lot more going on, and more, and and more activists around them, supporting them. And so now, doing this, this type of work is more isolated than in the past. So, so um, it's uh, it just isn't the same as being a part of like this this huge this huge type of movement, but, but, but the other hand, I'm, I'm relieved, you know, that, that 30 years we've gone a lot farther, you know, and to have grown up in this time and not uh, in the past, when, when a lot of my choices would have been much more restricted. So, so yeah, it is, it is a sort of a strange time, like I said, for, for someone doing my type of work. Do you use the internet in your work? Uh, yes, definitely. Awesome. Um, that when I started this book seven years ago, it was totally different. If I wanted an article, I had to go to the library or drive there, you know, park, copy it, drive back. You know, and now I can just um, go on, go online and get it and print it out in about a minute. So it does make researching a lot, a lot more easy. So if I have, if I'm fact checking, it's just so much more easy. I don't have to call like for days to check out a fact. I, I can just go and email somebody and they'll email me back and you know, so, so that makes a lot of the work easier. What about the distribution of your work and ideas? So um, it's a very good question that uh, that in a way things have gotten gotten a little harder that um, the, the trade publishers in the last 10 years since I started so they become much more corporate, you know, and and it's harder to, to write more about social issues and and stuff that's more challenging of the mainstream. So 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 I actually got more money for my first book, you know, when I was when I was much younger uh, than this one. So I, so with this one I went to the university press that's more um, independent minded. So so in a way it's gotten a little more difficult uh, to to write about these things. How old were you when you wrote your first book? Yeah, I was twenty three. So, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. It just that was sort of the zeitgeist of of the time where I really felt that no one had ever had ever talked to to younger women, and it was going to be a question about what they thought. So, so, and I got lucky. I got something in the, in the New York Times when, when I was when I was twenty three about young feminists, and that sort sort of helped everything to get a book contract, and and so that just seemed to be the this huge glaring niche that no one else was filling. Mm. What ideas do you have to, to share with other aspiring young writers? Uh, let's see. Um. I mean, perhaps the whole entire medium of you know, print uh, journalism or uh, books could cease to exist 50, 100 years from now. Oh, my goodness. Who knows? <laughs> Still people uh, getting yeah. their ideas out there, whatever shape they may take, though. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, um, that people in their, the women in their 20s, they're so vital to the, to the women's movement that they have so much energy and sometimes sometimes fewer fewer financial responsibilities. You know, so I would encourage people, you know, in their, their early 20s, it isn't, it isn't too early or you're not, a lot of times people are insecure, they don't know enough yet, but, but these are some of the most important people you know, to, to the movement, you know, in whatever way, and and to act in whatever way you can. But I feel like everyone has their own different path, and someone could uh, could approach this whole thing uh, through some whole new technology we've never, 
someone that we don't even know about yet, you know, and someone else, like I said, could be more mainstream and, and target all the bankers downtown, and someone else could, could be more radical. So we need all these different channels. So, um, but as far as being a writer, yeah, it's, um, I would say only do it if you have a really strong passion for it, because you're really going against the grain of society. It's such a, a tough field. To um, you know, to, to to survive in. So there's so many ups and downs of the market you can't control. Um, there's burnout. You know, so so you really have to have a strong passion for it. And uh, it doesn't hurt to, to marry rich. It's probably the first <laughs> the first advice. So so because you can't be worrying about money. You know, if you're if you're writing. So so if there's any any source, uh, don't feel guilty about it. Uh, if you have rich parents, uh, don't feel guilty, and uh, you know whatever resources you have, make the most of it. Mm. Can you tell me about the neighborhood you live in? So yeah, this is a fabulous neighborhood. Um, it's it's very eclectic, so it's always interesting. I mean, it used to be um, it's called Andersonville, so I'm assuming that means that it used to be primarily Swedish or Scandinavian and you still see a lot of that you know different Swedish restaurants and, and people have these amazing tulip gardens and you know, a great great manicured uh, flower patches all over the place um, and then and then some Arabs moved in and, and you have some great places to go for Middle Eastern food around here um, and then there's a big gay and lesbian community also um, and the lake is just about four blocks away, so it's great to, to go ride the bike on the on the bike path at the end of the day. Um, just the simple pleasures are good in this neighborhood. You know, there's great cafes to go to. Um, it's not as, as congested as other ones, but a lot of the yuppies are discovering it. So it used to be a real cheap place to live for poor artists, but now it's becoming a lot more affluent. So at this apartment, um, I keep I keep expecting to be thrown out if it goes condo, but we'll see. So, Do you have any sense of how much a one, two, or three bedroom apartments are going for in this neighborhood these days? So yeah, I definitely do. So this place, this is a one bedroom, uh, it's about average size, it's, it's 685 a month, but that, that's under market value. I'd say about, about 8 to 850 is probably um, a one bedroom in this area. So, so I, but, but I've seen them for a thousand, twelve hundred, also. So, like I said, it's changed dramatically. Where this is a lot more than even five years ago. So. What were you paying for the same property five years ago? Let's see. Well, actually, in '91, I went to Chicago, and I was in Hyde Park um, with a roommate. It was four fifty for a two bedroom. So, <laughs> but so that wasn't in the in the best area of Hyde Park, but. Um, but yeah, it's it's gone up steadily where, where it's been more difficult. So then, I, so when I moved I moved to Lakeview in in '93, and I had two roommates, and and that rent was about 900 for three people or, or 950. And then in '95 it started going up, and I moved to to a lower rent neighborhood with a roommate. It, it, was, it was the same rent for a two bedroom. So so it just it keeps going steadily up here. Mm. But it's different. When I was in college in Champaign Urbana, it was 150 a month. So that was in the in the mid 80s or late 80s. So. Anything else that you would like me to ask you about, or that you'd like to talk about? So boy, um, let me say, let me say just that um, that Chicago is um, is deeply ingrained in my work. You know, it, it helps to form my sensibilities. My family is from here. Uh, my grandfather was a kosher butcher. You know, he, ca he came here in the early 20s and lived on the west side. Um, and my dad, um, he went to, to, to John Marshall High School on the west side, he and his siblings. Um, and, uh, and he went to, to, to Herschel Junior College and then Roosevelt University. Then I was born on the, on the south side. And then we moved to the south suburbs when I when I was young, and um, so so it's always been um, you know so it's always been a part of who I am, and um, and it really it really um, it's um, it's a great place 
to be a writer, there's always stories to mine, you know, that, 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 um, that are very rich and have a lot of different cultures, and, and, it, and uh, it isn't like New York where everybody seems to be just covering them, or, or covering a more um, insulated type of culture, you know, and there's, and there's um, a lot more writers around, so they're just, uh, so there's a lot of material here that's still been undiscovered. So that's probably the most important thing of being a writer is the actual material, and that's definitely here. Mm. I guess that's it. Cool. Once more, will you tell me your name and where we are? Okay. Yeah, I'm Paula Kamen, and we're in Andersonville neighborhood of Chicago. Cool. So do you want the date to? Sure. Or okay, it's um it's July 28th uh, at about 4 something p.m. This year. Uh, 2000. Cool. Okay. <laughs> thanks, Paul. Okay, thanks.